I thought it was about time we did another Maggie Bot vlog. Um, I have a lot to catch you up on. It's been about a month since we chatted, and in that time I've played a bunch of new games, revisited some older games, and I also had a chance to do a couple of events that I wanted to share. Um, I have to split my time a little bit wisely as of late because uh, in mid-May we do uh, what's called the Gauntlet, which is the big charity tournament from my work. Uh, we put it on, we bring in 20 different companies, four players each. They raise money for our beneficiary, who's Youth Care this year. And based on the amount of money that they raised before they got to the tournament, they get special power-ups and um, considerations in the games. Um, so it turns into kind of this part-time job for me every April and May where we're putting on this giant production, lots of cool stuff. Um, this year, we have, at the time that I filmed this, we have raised $29,000, and that's with only maybe a quarter of the teams already raising funds, so we'll, we'll definitely be making our goal of $50,000, hopefully more. Youth Care is an amazing, amazing org, and they do really cool things to keep young people, get them off the street, out of bad situations, get them the care that they need, or even if those young people aren't ready for that, just get them meals and deodorant and sunscreen and let them know that there will be a place for them at some point if they're ever ready. Um, it's a really caring org, and um, a couple years back, the state declared homelessness in Washington a state of emergency and so they have been infused with some new funds so they've been pairing with the schools and making new job programs. Um, Starbucks comes in and teaches them how to pull shots like a barista and then allows them to interview for jobs later. Um, there are a couple of Starbucks here in town that specifically look to this program to hire um, which is pretty darn inspiring and all the coffee gets donated from lots of different coffee places around the city and that's all done at one of their centers, but they have multiple centers, multiple housing situations. They help so many people. So I'm excited to give back to them a little bit, but that meant that um, we picked out games this year. So we do a trivia portion, and then I picked out games to go with our kind of Greco-Roman theme. So we are doing Deus, which is a pearl game in which you kind of chain together these cards and build out into the town. It's interesting and bright and colorful and it's neat. It's not my fave, but it's very cool and it is balanced enough for a situation like what we have. Um, we do have a couple of teams trying to tell me that they are imbalanced again, but they say that every year and they're never the same things that they find are imbalanced from team to team. Um, but the other one that we got to um, incorporate was Concordia. And Concordia is just one of those fantastic games that gets better the more you play it. Um, such a cool scoring mechanism. You're, you know, building out on the board and doing all kinds of things and producing goods. But really, what matter are the cards you buy because they're all multipliers at the end of the game. So, I'm excited to see 80 people sit down and play Concordia. That should be fun. Um, and then the last thing, we do a super secret something. Um, I will link to uh, the gauntlet video once it's live after the 15th. Um, and you'll, you'll be impressed, I'm sure, because it's pretty cool. Um, but that's, I mean, that's coming up in May, May 15. Um, the gauntlet is moxboardinghouse.com slash gauntlet. Um, and you can find all of the teams and you could donate money. You can share links. You could do a lot of things. And I would love that. Um, other two things, I actually did some cool events a couple weeks ago. Um, one was called the Top of the World at Columbia Tower. Um, this was FTW events. They've done this particular event a couple times in the past, but it was under a different company name. This is a benefit for the Seattle Children's Hospitals. Um, it's one, um, I got to meet a gentleman named Matt Winberry who's putting it on and he asked us, and, and Ray from Calliope Games asked us to come in and do the pop-up store and help promote a little bit. Um, I was already attending the thing, so I had tickets. So what I did is I helped my company kind of put up the pop-up store and then I left them to man it while I went and played games because, yeah. <laughs> I'm a jerk, but uh, it was a really good time and they ended up raising four thousand dollars for Seattle Children's Hospital And that is a fantastic thing. Um, we are going to work with Matt again on um, Even how to do that 
to a greater extent in future years and I wish him all the best. But one of my favorite things that happened that night, um, I was going around and kind of talking with the people I did know at the event, um, which was only a few, not, not that many. Um, but then there was a gentleman that was just kind of walking by with this in his hand. <laughs> and I, no joke, jaw dropped. Hey, are you playing that? Can I play that with you? Can I play that? Because I've always wanted to try Tribune. Um, this game came out, I think, 2009 or 2006, one or the other. Um, Fantasy Flight did it, and since then, it has always been kind of on my radar to pick up if I could find it. Um, it's got some cool drafting mechanics and a worker placement aspect that I think is very unique. Um, we played it that night, and I thought it was good. I want to wait for opinions because I have always heard that the expansion is what made it balanced and brilliant. Um, not brilliant is probably too strong a word, but good. Uh, so a friend of mine had a spare copy of both the base and the expansion, and I look forward to more info on that later. Um, then two nights after that, I got into a uh, the Emerald City Comic Con uh, World Builders Party, which World Builders is Patrick Rothfuss's charitable uh, foundation. They benefit Heifer International, who sends like chickens and goats and cows to people who would like to have more sustainable agriculture and farming. Um, it is a great org and this party was really unique. So a guy named Greg Bilsland who works in Dungeons and Dragons at Watsi, um, he just kind of put this on with his friends and had this great idea. Okay, what happens if we get some of our celebrity friends to lend us their time and then ask people to pay ticket price to come play games with these amazing people? So Jason Bullman, Mike Selinker, uh, Patrick Rothfuss himself, um, lots of authors, lots of game designers, all at a table and then if you paid a ticket you got a chance to go and play like a face to face game with them. Um, a really cool idea and everyone was in really good spirits. Um, even the authors and the celebrities were signing whatever came near them and talking with people and chatting it up and having a great time. There was a bar and we at Card Kingdom got to bring in the games that they would play like the copies of the games. Um, and it was a great time and it was really inspiring. You don't get to see people meet their idols that much and you just got to see it all night long. So um, that one raised $14,000 for charity and that was just crazy generosity. I saw some of the silent auction stuff was just like bananas what people were willing to give to this org for, you know, small pieces of jewelry and books and things that are very cool but they were paying off the wall prices. So it was, it was inspiring and I really, really love to be there so I can't wait for the next one. One of the games I picked up this month was a two-player reprint from Cosmos, um, Tames and Cosmos. Uh, this is the Rose King from Dark Hen. Um, the Rose King has a pretty Othello tactics feel to it. You're trying to, um, you've got pieces out on the board and they flip, you know, red or white. And if you're the red person, you want to win with red. If you're the white person, you want to win with white. And you have these little tactics cards and you run around trying to flip over things to your side. Um, so pretty simple gameplay. It's a two-player abstract. And the board, though kind of uninspiring um, from afar, when you're looking up close at it, it has a really nice uh, gray on black filigree on the outsides. And the map is nicely detailed. Um, I don't know that I would recommend purchasing this game. It's just not a lot of content for your money unless you like very simple two-player abstracts. It was fun. Um, you basically get points for however big your territory becomes at the end. Um, a little bit of math, but uh, kind of uninspiring. One that did inspire me quite a bit was the second in the Dice Tower Essentials line came out, and that is Onitama. Onitama is a two-player abstract, lasts about 15 minutes. Um, it's tactical, not strategic for the most part. Um, you have this beautiful little insert that has all the bits, um, and then you have a few cards that fit in the side. And then with the leftover room to keep everything kind of snug, you have the game board. But the game board is a rolled up play mat. So they did a really, really good job with the bits on this. The size of box is perfect, and I really, really hope this becomes a trend with the square-shaped box. It's gonna 
work so well to stack on shelves, store shelves, home shelves, all shelves. Um, the play mat itself is very, very high quality. They, they went to town on this game. So um, it's a very small board. Um, it is five by five, and you start your master in the center with two disciples on either side, and they start on the other one. And your goal is to capture the other person's master or get to their temple with yours. For me, it felt rather similar to Tosh Kalar. At the very beginning of the game, you take the deck of cards and you choose five for that game, right? So you usually will take them randomly. Each player gets two face up in front of them, and one goes face up into the middle of the table. As you can see on the cards, and I'll probably do a little digital close-up, um, there is a dark square and then some light squares around it. When you have a turn, you just choose one of the two cards in front of you and you take a piece and you make a movement. So the black square is where the piece is and the movement can be anywhere that was colored in. Kind of, if I wanted to use elephant, I could take any piece on the board and move it one over and one up or one over or the other way and one over and one up. Um, once I'm done with that movement, I put the card in the middle and it trades with whatever was in the middle before. So that way, you can see what your opponent can do, but you're also giving them access to future turns as you play your cards. So if I know that you really need to get out of a corner, I don't want to give you much left movement. Um, a really interesting way to do that. The only thing I will say about this game, because I think it's pretty fabulous, really worth the price point. I know people were saying 25 is high, but the component quality and the care that went into making this is really, really high. Um, I challenge someone to prove that Tiger is not a broken card. Um, Tiger allows a player to move two spaces forward or one back. Um, any game in which I have Tiger on turn zero, I will win. It is too much of a threat. It's too far to jump forward in a five by five grid. Um, anything was any games that we played with lots of forward movement were much faster than games with lots of diagonals or sideways stuff. But uh, Tiger, I just hold on, keep it as a threat, and force you um, to lose the game. It's it's too powerful. I, I don't think we'll be playing with it anymore, but I, this is 10 or 11 games in. I, know, I do know that some people have played a lot more of this than me, so I would like to hear about Tiger from some of them. One of the other new games I played this month was Quadropolis, uh, which is the Days of Wonder game. Uh, a lot of people have had this for a few months now, um, review copies, German copies, whatever. Uh, but in the States, it just came out for stores, uh, so I bought it at work. Um, and it comes with kind of two flavors. It comes with a casual and an expert mode. The casual mode, everyone kind of gets their own architects and um, does their own thing. And the expert mode adds different types of a new district and two more types of buildings. And it takes um, all of your architects, which are how you bid on tiles, and puts them into a shared pool. So everyone just takes from the same shared pool, which means you are not restricted into specific numbers at any given time and you're trying to spite other people and so far I believe that is going to be one of the only types of interaction you can make in this game. You are definitely trying to build things that other people want but you would love it if people would just leave your strategy alone um, and especially with the shared pool of architects there can definitely be a lot more contentious nature to it. So fun so far. I'm, I'm looking forward to future plays. I played a two player and a four player and I taught a three player. The two player version is, it's just, it's not good. You need more interaction. You need more people. You need new tiles to be gone by the time your turn is done. So not two players, I don't think. Another game I got from Kickstarter was Factory Funner. Uh, this is the second version of a game called Factory Fun. Uh, it is sort of real time. <laughs> sort of kind of. Uh, Factory Funner is some crazy number of players, like two to six or something. It's a giant table hog, I will warn you now, because each player gets a factory to build. Um, so there are two sides, each, each board is unique, and anything you see, like the big black spot in the middle, that's all obstructing you from building, and um, players all will reveal uh, tiles like this into the middle of the table at the same time. And then you look at those tiles and you decide which one of them you might want to build this round. 
there's consequences if you pick up the wrong tile. And it's really hard to know. Your, your brain is trying to kind of replace the tile a couple times until you get it just right before you pick it up. Because the second you pick it up, you have to put it on the board. If you don't, you can discard it and you, there's penalties. There's also penalties for being the first person to pick up a tile. And there's a bonus if you're the last person to pick up a tile. If you pick up the last, last tile and you don't want to place it, there's no penalty for not placing it. Um, as you go, you're going to be trying to tile these tiles back to sources that pump out the right kind of energy. And you do that by attaching a million different little pipes and things that can't crisscross and can't go to the same spot. Um, I found this game to be extremely challenging. I found the real time element not to be that intimidating. It's not like space alert or time and space, which is frantic almost. This game is very measured. You gotta be kind of careful not to get grabby. Uh, you grab the wrong piece or it has the wrong outputs or doesn't go the way you want it to and there are lots of consequences for not being able to place it and you likely will not win. Um, we played it a few times. It is giant, just takes over huge swaths of space. So make sure to maybe play it at home. It didn't really work as a bar game. Um, but I, we enjoyed it quite a bit. It is brain burning for me. I kind of want to play I have one friend that's just naturally really good at this type of stuff. I really want to watch him play it because I bet he'll make a beautiful machine. Um, we played a prototype once and it, it required you like rotating cogs until they fit together and he was like a savant at it. So I will be interested to see if he'll play this with me. I just saw him yesterday. I should have gotten him. Darn it. Okay, seriously, Seattle's trying to make it up for us. We were having 88 degree weather, like a heat wave happened for three or four days, and now it's hailing outside because it's trying to make it up. <laughs> so beautiful. We went out to brunch tonight earlier. So spring has sprung, um, at least here in Seattle, we're seeing a lot of flowers and weird heat waves and hail. And what that means for Euro gamers like you and I, that means generally slower between releases, not a lot of games coming out that we can try that are new, which is good because it means we can go back and relearn games, retry them, give them another shake, stuff that maybe passed you by or wasn't good enough for you at the time for you to integrate it into your regular play. Um, so the two that I chose to do were Madeira and Keyflower. Now Keyflower, we only played two player for my relearn game, which is not very typical for Keyflower, and I thought it worked pretty darn well. It was the fastest game, it was like maybe an hour, hour and a half. Very good, I'll probably be picking up a copy of it. It was well worth at least relearning, because I knew that so many of my friends love it, so many gamers love it, that I decided to give it another go. I think it's lighter than people give it credit for, I don't think it's quite that heavy, but it is very fun. But the big one that I, I owed the world, I owed the world another play of Madeira. Uh, Madeira is a two to four player game from Nuno and Paolo who didn't Nippon, which was my favorite game last year. Um, this one is more, <sighs> Madeira is more about planning for good probability. <laughs> You are setting up your best stakes, basically. Um, so everyone's going to get some dice that's based on turn order. And those dice are going to enable you to place them out on the board to get an immediate action. At the end of the round, it's going to give you access to a separate action or having to pay. When you play a die, you're kind of restricted where it can go. And that's based on the number on the top you can affect that with resources in the game. Or instead of playing one of your own dice, you could always play a pirate die as long as you've got it set up correctly. The pirate die will give you the immediate effect and anyone else that has played there, it will affect negatively slightly at the end of the round. Um, you are trying to get to these objective things and you've got a lot of them and you know they're coming and you're gonna have to fill, fulfill them all as best you can. And that is the really hard part about this game is to focus on the objectives, to get there, to work on having enough food and not needing to use the windmill in a really negative way, um, which is a really cool mechanic. I'm not complaining. It's a very really cool mechanic. Um, Madeira, I do think I like it better than I originally did. 
Uh, I enjoyed some of the decisions. I really like trying to get to your objectives. The game does not work if you have AP prone people in your group. There are too many things that happen with every single decision you make that people are going to be tempted into that 10 minutes staring at the board before they take a single move. I always say that if in a game I take one or two of those pauses, that is a good game. That means that my decisions were not so tough that I felt like I had to make the best, best one that's ever happened, but it meant that I was invested enough where when time was coming down to it, I really wanted to make sure I pulled off whatever strategy I went for. Uh, Madeira will come out again. It will not come out around people that take a long time on their turns. Uh, it's hard enough to string together your thoughts in the game without someone helping you. <laughs> um, and the other one, the last game I wanted to talk about uh, was from Martin Wallace. And this was, I think, technically 2016, but I'm not sure when it officially came out. Um, Martin Wallace and his relationship with retail and distribution lines is tenuous at best. I think he's been through too much drama with Queen and Eagle Griffin, and, and so he's just kind of doing his own thing now. So um, Tree Frog Games don't usually come out timely through regular distribution where stores can just pick them up. So his games are a little harder to get a hold of these days. And so Ships was one I had not played that uh, a friend of mine had a copy of. I, I was happy to try it. Martin Wallace games to me sometimes can feel a little clunky, just a little too much in the soup. You know, just one, one or two ingredients less and the thing would be a beautiful thing. Um, but Brass is a good game, not a great game. It's got such a cool scoring mechanic and so just such cool ideas, but I don't really enjoy playing it, which is a problem. Um, a study in Emerald, I didn't play the second edition, I only played the first edition, and the thing was a mess. It just had so many bits in it that it couldn't focus in on what it did well, which was a very unique take on deck building. And I know a lot of people love it. I tried, I did. I played seven games of it before I just, no, I hate this game. <laughs> but, um, Chips is beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Like, look at this thing, that, that is gorgeous. Um, the inside, not so much, the player boards and all that, the actual player aids look like clip art. It looks really bad. But the board is beautiful, the book is beautiful, the cover is beautiful. And because the limited edition is not that hard to get your hands on, it comes with um, spray painted gold wooden coins instead of the chits and wooden bits, which are really beautiful. Um, I will always spring that extra $10 for a limited edition, you know. So, um, the reason I'm talking about ships right now, uh, when I played it, I immediately went and bought it. I loved it, and I thought it was so fun and smart and clean, really easy to learn and cool to play, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Then you don't hear about it from anyone, and I went today to, before I did the video, I went to see what people didn't care for about it. And there really aren't that many reviews. There are two written reviews on Board Game Geek at this time, and there are maybe three English video reviews. So I happen to remember two of my friends saying they didn't really care for it. So I went and I asked them over Twitter, it's like, hey, could you clue me in? What, what didn't you like about ships? Because most of the reviews I read, all of them actually, all of the reviews I watched or read were positive almost glowing. So uh, Joel Eddy seemed to really like it, Tom Vassell seemed to really like it, um, and Tom Vassell and I don't usually get along on Euros. I know he likes Martin Wallace, but that, that was surprising to me. And so they both said the same thing though, and that this rule book makes something very simple, very complicated. For about six pages, it tells you how to place a ship onto the board, which you do almost every turn. <laughs> so because every time you place a ship, you're gonna do one of two things, and then those do one of two things. They kind of over-explain them throughout the rulebook. So this rules text will not help you learn the game. It's, it's not good. Uh, last night I was gonna play it real quick because I had people that wouldn't mind, but I couldn't get through the rules fast enough to, to explain it at a con day. I just need to 
re-read it all the way through and so I can use my own words because reading this out of the book is confusing and weird. So that's, that's hit one. Ships does a very bad job of explaining this clean, beautiful game. The other thing it doesn't do well, it doesn't make a lot of sense why you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> So there's kind of the outer board and an inner board, and the outer board is kind of a timer for the game. You're placing ships, and as you progress the ships, you erase other people's ships, and you have to pay extra resources, but you get stuff. Um, but as other people progress, it allows other opponents to, to kind of meet them there. Um, and you're doing all this to build up your resources, so you have coins and stuff, and you're wanting to build on in the inner spaces, because that's where all the points are and there's scorings in there. Um, but none of it really thematically makes any sense at all. At all. Um, if you were to look at the board and try and figure out why you were doing what you were doing, you would not understand that this was supposed to be ships and trading. Um, and then the folks from Twitter both said that they didn't know that it was balanced for two player and the other one said that she didn't feel that it had an engine build quality it was just objective completion I guess um, and I would agree with that it's not much of an engine builder you 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 gain resources more at the end of the game than you did at the beginning but that's because the game has manufactured that for you it has built you an engine that you're just trying to use optimally and you're trying to get into the spaces that will score you the most points and you're trying to spend your gold the wisest and do do things the best you can with an engine that's already on on its way um, so when you look at a game and you say you know that's a sandbox game this is much more on the guided type game side. Um, so that might not be her thing or maybe um, she had a different reason for not feeling like it built an engine but I would agree that it's not much of a buy this thing and upgrade and upgrade and a tech tree type game. It's much more about using the resources that are going to happen anyway because you use them or lose them and that can be very cool the decision for me personally I, I kind of like that um, if a game only gives you you know X Y and Z and you have to use them to try and complete something I find that to be an interesting challenge um, so for me ships is beautiful easy to learn and teach um, just with a hideously bad rule book uh, it has some interesting decisions it has good scoring it doesn't have so much of a runaway leader problem um, we found it pretty balanced at four players so I'm excited to get it to the table more often um, it's just a matter of being able to teach it in my own words so I need to get it played again very soon <laughs> Thank you for watching everyone. It was kind of a slow games month for me. Uh, just got so darn busy, lots of stuff going on, but uh, I am really, really happy that you watched this and I look forward to having some more content up soon. Let me tell you, if you are still watching, um, on May 1st we will have a soft launch of our website coming up. It's going to be a website that doesn't just do reviews. Um, it does articles about kind of um, game nights, how to build community, how to do char charity gaming events, as well as what I would like to do, I think, and internet stay with me because I think this is going to be cool, is strategy guides. So um, especially for games that are like Terra Mystica, infinitely replayable, uh, I think it will be interesting to try and do a Terra Mystica 101 and Terra Mystica 201. It doesn't necessarily teach the game, but it does teach a little bit of the strategy behind playing it well. Uh, I have a pretty good crew for this, and my partner Brian uh, has committed to doing at least the 101. I'm trying to get him to commit to doing each race one by one. Um, teaching how to play like swarmlings and witches. Some of those would be very short, so they could probably be paired up, but um, if you want to play a game better, I think that there could be a resource online for that. Um, Meeple's Included will reflect me and my beliefs and will include diversity and inclusivity into what we talk about, and I'm not going to apologize for that. And when you're on other people's projects, you can't do that to the full force, so I will be happy to have my own spot. I'm also considering doing a podcast right now. I would very much like to do that, and I have someone willing, hopefully, to edit it 
for me because editing a podcast sounds difficult. I guess I haven't tried it, but it does sound difficult. Um, so lots of stuff coming up. I like to see you all soon.